Georgia after the Rose Revolution. Um, the fact that despite the challenging environment nationally and internationally, Georgia managed to continue the reforms um, and make the progress is due to certain key individuals in this country, and Mr. Kaka Bendukiza is one of them. He was the driving force of the economic and political transformation and reforms of Georgia. Under his leadership, Georgia opened its economy to trade and investments. Georgia managed to reduce bureaucratic barriers for businesses. Uh, licenses and permits were reduced significantly. Uh, Georgia took the trend to liberalize its economy and became one of the top reformer countries uh, in the world under the World Bank's Doing Business uh, report. Uh, Mr. Bendukiza began his career in Russia as a biologist. Uh, soon he became a very successful uh, businessman, well-known businessman, uh, ha heading the you know, company o OMZ, uh, that is one of the Russia's largest heavy engineering company. However, in 2004, after the Rose Revolution, he decided to leave Russia and his business behind to join the team of the passionate individuals to reform our country, Georgia. Since then, over the course of the five years, he was responsible for designing and coordination of the reforms in Georgia. He served as the Minister of Economics, State Minister of Reforms Coordination, and the head of the State Chancellor in Georgia. In 2009, he left the public sector again and uh, yeah, became the chairman of the board of trustees of the Free University of Tbilisi, this university, which is one of the leading uh, universities in Tbilisi, um, and very well recognized, um, attracting the high-ranked students. Uh, for all this, I was very honored uh, to get the confirmation from Mr. Bandukita uh, to speak for you today in the framework of our program about the economic reforms in our country, the accomplishments and the challenges that remain. Thank you. Please. I should invite you on my funeral.
few hours a day. Um, uh, and uh, it's, uh, there's a, it's not a joke, it's a little story that for the revolution, uh, the residence of the president of Georgia was uh, cut from water supply at the six year every day. So, um, um, the significant part of Georgian territory, 17% was occupied by Russia and still occupied by Russia. Uh, we have two Russian military bases in other parts of Georgia, in Batumi and Al-Kalaki, in South uh, Georgia and the seaside. Uh, our main trade partner was Russia. The export, total export was 400 million dollars. The factual budget revenues were roughly the same. When I became a minister, uh, the Ministry of Economic Development was very good agencies working under the umbrella of Ministry of Economic Development, and, uh, including the Department of Statistics, which is the statistics for Georgia. And uh, I have some questions about some particular figures, and I invite one guy who was working there. Uh, and, uh, at the same time, I was looking for uh, the structure of this department of statistics, and I found that that guy earns a, uh, $20 a, a, a month. And uh, uh, it was, I, 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 I was scared because it was clear that for $20 per month, he cannot eat properly, and uh, or in, in my I imagine a guy who is who wears, I mean, no clothes, I mean, because I mean, it's possible to eat and buy something, some clothing, or he must, I think, oh, he can die in my room, yeah, from starvation. Uh, and I found that, I mean, no, it's, it was wrong perception because he was, he, he has second job, I mean, this is second job, and. Uh, it was one of the lessons that I mean, uh, don't believe in uh, formal figures. Yeah. He was not starving, he was not dying, he was, he, had, he, he, he was not a millionaire, of course, but I mean, he was for that level of Georgian, uh, Georgian uh, development, he was a little, little earning guy. Yeah. So that was the what, what was in public sector that uh, there was big public sector, lots of bureaucrats with very small salaries, uh, and everyone knows that that salaries are not enough for their uh, sustainable life. And uh, but it was like a, it was like false job creation. And nobody wants to make a decision, tough decision, instead of having thousand low paid, <coughs> not doing anything, public employees to have one hundred better paid and hard working. So, so that was the country. That was the legacy of previous years of mistakes and wrongdoing. And the question was, of course, what what we need to do. Uh, and uh, it was clear that you cannot use some, let's say, soft prescriptions. Uh, that you cannot use the prescriptions which will be successful in Central European countries or in Latin America for this country, because this country has much bigger problems. And you need to, 
So if you if you if you if you if you, if you uh, implement some average program, average program in average country gives you average result. Average program in country with huge problems give you bad results. Yeah. So that's why you need to make much more radical, much more profound changes. So, and um, what was, and also what's important to mention is that we inherit huge corruption. Actually, the Rose Revolution was uh, was mainly anti-corruption revolution, and uh, you can have nice government which declares that they fight corruption. You can have nice government which is clean by itself, but if you have huge inefficient public sector, there would be corruption. They the same massive corruption. It's unavoidable. So uh, that was the what we have. And the was there is um, in um, strategies around the world uh, can develop some plans. I don't know, for example, I was recently in Tunisia, invited by the government, and they also have this revolution that they kick off become the country Ben Ali regime. And uh, they are now looking to prepare some five year plan for reforms. Um, I, I always was sure that it's useless exercise. Not useless, but bad and counterproductive. Because if you, it's a political momentum. If you, if you have something big happens and you have big mandate, credit from your, uh, your public, you should do something very quickly. And as much you have, you can do it better. Uh, and also it's about some of the reforms you can do now and some of the reforms there is internal resistance which prevents you doing these reforms now maybe you can fight it many years without any result. And we have that sort of reforms also. So we are not an ideal country who has done all the all all good things we have something to do in the future also. So uh, the the basic was that we should have a very radical program uh, to let's say to create very business friendly environment because that's the only way how we can get out of that mess. And also we need to have very radical public sector restructuring which can help us to get rid of corruption. And actually, it was done. Uh, the amount of public, public, public agencies was reduced twice, times. Uh, very significant reduction of public employees, actually more than two times. There was this significant reforms of some things like police, etc., which you, you will have to look at, you know, additional but separate uh, culture. And for economic development, and there is no such thing that economic development without development as it is. Yeah. So you can say that this, this law is about economics, and this law is not about something else because everything is, everything is affecting economic development. Of course economic development is about how people are living and what they are doing and what their aspirations and uh, what they want to achieve. Um, there was several big things, let's say three of them. You can say that Exaggerated a little bit that these three things were the 
main things. First was, first does not mean the most important, was tax reform, privatization and deregulation. So, the, uh, tax reform, deregulation and privatization. And let's discuss which of them why it was important. Actually, Georgia has quite high tax rates uh, compared to it has tax rates like some Western European country and uh, higher than the United States, but the collection tax was terrible and uh, so in theory we should collect more than 50% of GDP as taxes which will kill the economy anyway and we are collecting uh, less than 13% of GDP so it was let's say three times four times worse a collection than ideal collection and there was huge amount of different taxes, lots of exceptions, and as I mentioned, high rates. And uh, the decision was to abolish more than 15, 14 taxes completely, uh, to reduce most of them, go to flat tax for income tax, and uh, also to have a tax amnesty, which means that nobody should be penalized for tax wrongdoing before 1st January. Uh, the result was tremendous, actually, because uh, at the same time, including the Ministry of Finance and the Revenue Service as public agency, and reducing and, and, and uh, uh, killing most of the taxes and reducing the remaining taxes, we get much more, much, much more collection. Less than 13%, we get 21% of tax collection of GDP. Today it's 26.5. And during these years, we each year more or less, we were reducing, reducing taxes, reducing the, not 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 huge reductions, but some reductions, some easing happens each year including the DC, and the tax collection goes up a little bit each year also, due to improvement of collection, and uh, so that uh, more and more uh, industries are going from uh, having some shadow operations, cleaning those and transport operations. So that was the tax, what happened to taxes? So another was the privatization. I mean, I think that uh, for you maybe it's quite difficult to understand uh, the legacy of Soviet Empire when you have the, everything owned by government. Uh, everything means everything. Of course, in 2004, a big part was divested by government, but there was still a lot of Remaining, uh, remaining assets. And well, everything means that you not only have, for example, public owned schools, but you also have public owned restaurants or public owned uh, shops, or public owned uh, department stores, etc., etc. And uh, uh, 
the idea was that we should divest everything. Why? Because actually there is three components why privatization is important. First is institutional. So having private property instead of state property or public property is big institutional change in the economy. Because you have much more flexible, responsible, uh, innovative, etc. companies than you have before. And it's changing the economic environment. Second is uh, the uh, fiscal side. If you are selling for cash, that's the best way how you can invest uh, companies, state owned companies. You are earning money in your budget, which in this transition period helps you to do something extra, not charging, not charging corner by taxes. And um, Third is uh, uh, the anti-corruption uh, outcome. Uh, in any country where you have state-owned companies, either state or property, someone is managing that company. And there is no country in the world. No country. But a different extent, a different extent of this and transparency, corruption, where the, the, the appointments are absolutely free from any political influence. Yeah. In, in Western Europe, there is quite, quite a lot of, in some countries especially, quite a lot of state-owned companies or state-controlled companies. The management of those companies Building good relations with politicians who have the less than be fired. So, and of course, in Georgia, where we decide to clean country from any sort of corruption, having state owned companies means that there will be sort of corruption. So, so someone will be asking for relatives or friends or friends of friends um, and um, I believe that they are good guys, well educated, um, Harvard University or Oxford or whatever and that, that's a sort of corruption. Maybe it's not such a, uh, such a uh, terrible sort of corruption where people are paying bribes in cases of cash but it's corruption also. So that's why we decided to privatize as much as possible, as soon as possible. I was quite naive, I was thinking that we can privatize everything in three years, but uh, it looks like the government has a lot of assets and when you privatize and make your first wave of privatization, uh, then you found that there is a lot of some other assets, small assets maybe, and the, the privatization can take uh, years and years. But uh, the first, uh, first uh, three years of privatization were very successful and uh, as we decided mainly to use privatization for cash for the highest bid, the, the auctions, the uh, total earnings of uh, Georgian government from privatization during these three years were, were 20 times more than uh, all previous years together, where the biggest part, the biggest chunk of property was damaged. And um, so it was the sec second pillar, so taxes, uh, privatization, and deregulation. Uh, deregulation means having less regulation. Why it is important? Uh, regulations needs money. Yeah. Each regulation has compliance costs. It's always. Uh, if you have country with very nice regulation, in my understanding there is no nice regulation. 
I think that my political views are very really far from what you can assess as normal. And uh, I, 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 I think that all the British are bad, but I mean, either if you have something which you can say is nice piece of regulation, that nice piece of regulation needs, needs uh, uh, money to, to be in compliance. So, what's the compliance cost? In the United States, the compliance cost is uh, about 6,000 something uh, per capita a year, which is one, is called one seventh of your GDP per capita. Yeah. So, that means that if we copy paste that sort of regulation, uh, we will have some roughly the same compliance cost, but our GDP per capita is 10 times less than US GDP per capita. That means that either some of the regulations will not work, and that source of corruption, or they will kill economic development. Yeah. So that's why it was very really important for Georgia to deregulate as much as possible. And uh, that deregulation uh, it was one of the most significant by my World Bank assessment was one of the most deep deregulation in the world taking place in that short quite short period of time, a few years, but that doesn't mean that it was finished, it, it continues. Some sort of deregulation takes place in 2009, 10, 11, and I hope this is also. And uh, what was the result? The result was that the Georgian economy uh, grew up very rapidly. So we have approximately 6% growth in 2004, 9% growth uh, approximately. Things. Next year, then 2005, then 10% growth in 2006, 12% growth, more than 12% in 2007, and uh, either in 2008, when we had a war, we have 2% growth, which was a result of, of course, very high growth before war and um, decline after war, and in 2000. In 2009, this was the first after war. So war was, as you know, today is the uh, four years from the beginning of the war, and it uh, actually the active phase was five days. So in 2009, the first post-war year, we have minus four percent decline, which is very sad that we have declined, but uh, the, uh, and it happens due to, uh, it was a result of double impact of war and financial crisis. And uh, after 2009, we have growth 6%, 7%, and this year also we have 7%. So, is this decline even small? No, we can say that it's quite small because the Armenia, not affected by the war, has declined minus 12%. And Russia, which is a huge country, and, uh, celebrating the victory of the Georgia after the war, they lose 11% of their economy in 2009. So, that was the, and of course that was the result of these measures, tax reform, continuous tax reform, let's say, privatization, deregulation. And of course, the, all this, the generally true government that we should have uh, no corruption, uh, zero tolerance to crime and especially to corruption. So, in very brief, that's the very short history. 
uh, economy of the world that I've worked here for the last years. And uh, if you want questions, if you have any. Why don't you name yourself, yeah. the university, and the specialization? Right. Um, my name is Nina. Uh, I graduate from Oxford Brookes University. Uh, I, I am a little bit <laughs> My name is Nina. I am graduated from Oxford Brookes University, um, politics and international relations. So economics is a very sphere, but I'm really interested in it. And I wonder what you think would be priorities for a better economy, uh, for sustainable goals, and prosperity of Georgia. So what do you think should be prioritized for uh, sustainable growth and prosperity? Like uh, agriculture? No, it's a useless question. Because they, 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 I mean, nobody knows what can be priority. Because, I mean, uh, future, nobody can organize future. It's impossible. Despite what your lecturers, professors are talking with you, <laughs> Nobody knows what will happen in the future. Yeah. Economy of future is what we cannot imagine. For example, um, I will say all this why well, it's impossible. Um, in, uh, you know, AT&T, the American telecom company, uh, and uh, 20 years ago it was the only American telecom company. So it was huge telecom company with the most brilliant engineers and managers. Eight research guys from AT&T, they get Nobel Prize. Yeah. So, and AT&T was working on mobile telephony uh, from 73. And um, in 1982 they decided that there is a lot of spendings and it's unclear what should be the future of mobile telephone. So they have mobile telephone, but I mean, there was a question about how commercially viable it, should, it can be in the future. And so AT&T was number one telecom company in the world. And they decided to hire very smart advisors. They go to what's the best uh, consultants in the world, Marklins. And they go to Madrid and hire Madrid. So they hire these very smart people to work together with very smart engineers to understand what's the future of mobile tech. And uh, they were working happily, something like that. And the final report of McKinsey was that mobile telephone has some future. In year 2000, what was there? In, in year 2002, maybe, 20 years from. Moment, globally will be 800,000 mobile telephones. 800,000. So, in Georgia today, there is several times more than that amount of mobile telephones. Yeah. So, why it happens? So, are we they stupid guys? No. Do they have not enough information? No, they have enough information. They know everything about telecommunication. They know everything about what was happening in the world, but they cannot predict the future, or nobody can predict the future. What, what was the decision of the uh, board of IBM when they, then their engineers invent and they produce first personal computer? You know that? They said, okay, very interesting invention. I, we think that annually we can produce five. Five personal computers a year. Not more. Yeah. So, from that point of view, when someone tells you, "Oh, I know what's the future of this or that country," don't believe. I mean, nobody knows. And the uh, and the companies which are today, for example, in the United States, the largest companies, they were not existing. Some of them, some of them, they were not existing in the five years. If how many is all the one? Twenty. Twenty. So 
five years ago, someone tell you that there is a guy in the uh, United States who creates a computer program where you can post your photos and I mean, ideas and whatever, and uh, you can uh, invite someone to be your friend, and that friends can read what you are thinking and what, what your what's your uh, photoshops. Yeah, and they were very nice, very nice, very nice. Yeah, and uh, if someone tell me to you, you or me, five years ago that that company will uh, make IPO with a valuation of one hundred billion dollars, I said that he's crazy. I think that they are crazy today I mean, <laughs> for that valuation, but I mean that happens. You know, one of the professors of Tuchenberg asked him what he wants to do in his life. He said, okay, I, I invented this. No, no, what do you want for a living, I mean, I mean, it's your hobby, but how you can earn money? I want to earn money from here on, it's not serious. So that's why which sectors of the economy will be, I mean, in 20 years from now, we maybe even don't know the names of that sectors of the economy. Yeah? Teleportation? I mean, dreaming? I don't know. <laughs> Something may be new, which we cannot imagine. Yeah? Uh, when in the 19th century, mayor of London decided to have a plan of London development, the result was very obscure because they, the guys he asked to produce it said that London cannot function after year 19 something. Why? Because the amount of shit produced by horses will be more than total footage of all land. <laughs> now it's uh, fine because we know that there are cars, but in the 19th century, we don't know that there are cars. <laughs> so that's the why, why predictions are impossible. Any other question? Thank you very much for Louder, please. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. I'm passionate about everything that was done with you. Uh, my name is Katerina, I'm Ukrainian. Perhaps I'm studying in France actually. Uh, uh, so um, I have a question concerning the public service reduction of employees because actually it's clear that it is a good decision because of good efficiency, uh, spending of financial resources. But on the other side, uh, there are a lot of people who lose, who lost uh, their jobs. So we have employment that increased uh, on the other side. What you decided to do with these people who yeah. lost it? Yeah. Most of them are inefficient, corrupt mm -hmm. officials. What I need to do with them? Yes, but ah. there are a lot of people like this, and you know, it's uh, the, it can be some level of uh, agreement with government, demonstration, etc. Sure, et it's for one side, but, but that would be anyway. So it's it's about for what you need government. If you want need government for just uh, sitting in the offices, it's okay. uh, uh, if you want government for doing better for all of us, government should take decisions. And there is a balance. Of course, if government make very harsh decisions and, and there was a revolution immediately after that, yeah, because that government has done nothing actually, because they was, was trying and they failed. But in this particular case, of course, there were a lot of harsh decisions, but also we have several elections after that. And we have upcoming elections in October, and I mean, this particular government was re-elected. Yeah, so that means that the benefits from government action is more than this, I mean, people who don't like government because they lose jobs, etc. Of course, for example, one guy, I, I, I fired two thirds of employees in Ministry of Economic Development and Agencies. And one of them, Actually, most of them were, I mean, not complaining because they, it was merit based uh, and I mean, no good hard working guy was fired. But one guy, there was three complaining, four complaining. And one comes and said, Why you fired me? 
I was not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. I was coming to my office, closing the door inside, and spending the eight hours. Why you find me? To save this few dozen dollars which I was earning? He was really surprised. But we should understand it. The each extra job in public sector, what it means, yeah? Is this a real job? No. It's an artificial job because it says no how it can from I mean in terms of good public goods created. Yeah. So that means that this guy is doing something bad. Yeah. In the best case scenario, he's like that guy, I mean she's not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> he's just occupying some part of office and using some sort of electricity and I mean, paper and pen. Yeah. But in the, but that's the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario he is taking bribes. What means taking bribes? Taking bribes means that he's distorting, distorting economic development and he's killing jobs. So, and that was very clear for us that one, that sort of artificial employment in public sector kills several jobs in private sector. Yeah, so, if you want to have the big public sector, that sort of public sector, that means that you will have very small economic development. That's a, that's a, tra a, a, a trade off you need to solve. I tell you, I was in Tunisia recently. Yeah? In Tunisia, they inherit this French public service system. So, country has 10 million citizens and they have 650,000 public employees. It's enormous, it's huge. 650,000. So, that's Five times more than Georgia. I mean, Belgium. Yeah? And uh, it's very clear that they need to. And that, that, that's eating huge amount of money. Yeah? So they, they have huge budget deficit. But they are unable to reduce this and to communicate with people and to explain. I think that. You always can explain general public that you are reducing the number of bureaucrats. And I am sure that general public will, will always support the reduction of the number of bureaucrats, especially if you show that these bureaucrats were not doing anything or were not doing anything good and were doing only everything bad. So that's in the So um, I'm just curious, where did all these people go? Like, did they. Did you Prison they them, go home. you know, they find home. them, sanction. Well, I mean, bureaucrats go home. Go home. I mean, do they go to the private sector more? Yeah, or? of course. Some of them go to the private sector, but and most of them actually, because them? they were, they were. I mean, most of them were. Not all of them, but most of them were corrupted officials. So they, that means that they have some money earned from the this illegal activity. And uh, I, 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 nobody has done that. So this is what uh, the case I know is that they all go to private sector and uh, some of them are quite doing quite well, some of them not. But of course, I'm, they don't ever put, uh, there was no uh, main evaporation, yeah? They don't disappear, so they are there. They, are, they exist. Of course, they are one of the cores of uh, uh, support, uh, oppositional support. That's clear. That's why government needs to have a political capital to burn it. No, actually it was that there was a revolution and there was a big, big, big mandate to government to change life. And uh, <coughs> that was the main. Yeah. Because uh, without that you cannot do 
And I think that it's important that we were very, very bad shape. Because yeah. I think that if you go to some quite well doing, uh, let's let's go to Europe, yeah. Europe is not okay. So nobody is doing reforms because everything is going well. Yeah. Norway, Norway has plenty of uh, income from oil, and nobody is talking about reforms in in Norway. Yeah. People are talking about reforms in Italy, in Spain, and in Greece. Some of them will succeed, some of them will. Yeah? But nobody is talking about reforms in Norway. The last reform they were discussing, it's not a joke, was that uh, when this government, this uh, left government, okay, well, what they, propo they proposed to build houses for the pensioners on the south coast of, on the, on, 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 on the south, south Europe, and the Mediterranean. That was the reform they implemented. And in Greece, they cannot discuss that sort of reforms, of course, yeah? Because they, they have done a lot of mistakes before. And they're discussing privatization, cutting public services, I mean, the amount of public employees, reducing the these unwanted spendings, etc. And same in Italy, and liberalizing the markets, deregulating the markets, the same in Spain, yeah? That's all. And if everything is working, nobody is making reforms of well-working institutions, yeah? Because there is no that signals that you must reform. So we are in very bad shape, and that was why... Another is that, after that, some governments can say, okay, now we have done everything, and that's stop changes and earn our popularity and some of the governments are continuing yeah. and trying to fight this uh, fight inside themselves themselves is populism yeah. so and so why some of the countries are growing many years and some of the countries have some short period of growth and then they stop and that's the difference between for example Singapore and Japan, yeah, because Japan and Singapore initially, with some time difference, they have the same very pro-market economic policies. But then Singapore continued to use that policies and Japan stopped. And then now what's the result? The result is that now Singapore is 50% richer than Japan. I mean, Every Singapore is fifty percent richer than every Japanese. And why? Because Japan decided that now it's time for some more soft, less radical, more spending wise policies. Okay. No other questions? Any more questions? ask about foreign economy because uh, it happens because it was a challenge when the largest foreign partners, Russia, uh, when the cooperation was stopped, so we had to diversify. So, what are your major partners, major sectors? No, it will be, yeah, it will, Russia is now the seventh trade partner by size, from, becoming from first going to seventh. Yeah, but it was not, I mean. It was not government's job to uh, diversify trade partners. It, it happens because government, government was not intervening there. And it was done by business, of course, by people themselves. Okay. And now the largest... Uh, so if we take EU as single, EU is the largest trade partner. If we take the different countries within EU, so the largest is Turkey, then it's Ukraine, Azerbaijan, uh, then maybe Germany. Uh, I guess I cannot, I cannot say. But in, uh, so the uh, more than quarter is the European Union, a little bit less than quarter is Tur Turkey, and all others are fifty percent. And um, the, uh, 
is the diversification situation. Also, it was not only diversification, it was also the growth because the export, which was up to 400 million, now it's more than 2 billion, which is quite, quite small. We need to have more export, but there is no way how government can improve that. The only way is just to have very simple regulation and very open. <coughs> Okay. Maybe last question from my side. Yes. Um, what is the main challenge at the moment for the economic development of our country? Could you speak about that a little bit? I think it's uh, the uh, risk coming from political side. Uh, one, and second is of course the global economic meltdown which can happen in the nearest future. Maybe, maybe, maybe because the uh, situation in uh, Europe is not improving and the United States also is not improving. And uh, it looks like that also now it has affected the uh, Chinese economy also. So if uh, there will be a global, uh, global uh, one more wave global crisis, so it will be quite difficult for Georgia to be have high growth uh, when there is the global energy decline. And political, because uh, uh, these elections and situation after election is challenging because uh, uh, there, is, there are populists, populists which uh, can and are trying to sell the politics of, uh, let's say, supporting everyone, you know, and the government can go to this race, you know, like this auction, who promised more, and uh, that's, that's the temptation to promise as much as possible for both sides, for opposition and for government, and then that means that we have quite difficult years uh, of at least not very really high growth. And why I'm also focused on growth because we are all middle income country. Uh, and we need to we need good growth to be close to the weakest European economies in 20 years. Yeah. That can, that's achievable only if we have good economic growth. And, uh, and that's essential because otherwise we have a, uh, threats to the integrity of Georgia if we don't have high growth. And that is both of the both of like how countries fail to economic stagnation. So I think that that's the that's two biggest that's, and, and this uh, this uh, populist uh, threat is much more significant because I mean global meltdown happens for everyone. Yeah, global meltdown is global meltdown. Okay, it's not nothing fun for nothing good in there, but it happens for everyone. Yeah, and uh, it's a question of who who was affected deeper or lighter. Populist auction is much more, much more terrible. Well, thank you very much for this very enlightening lecture.